Serpent, Per Granqvist, uh, and uh, Robbie Duchinsky. Um, if you guys can introduce yourselves. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, per Granqvist, I'm professor of developmental psychology at Stockholm University, a close co-worker with Tommy and these days Robbie yeah. as well. Um, as well as some of you who attend today as well. Hi, everyone. Um, I started out, my PhD was on applying attachment theory and research to the psychology of religion. But since then, my interests have broadened quite a bit uh, and certainly include applications of attachment theory in um, clinical and social work, among a lot of other things. And Robert? Okay. Uh, my name is Robert Jashinsky. Uh, I'm a professor of social science and health at the University of Cambridge. Um, my research predominantly focuses on child and family mental health um, um, and does so from a variety of different disciplines, uh, sociology, history, developmental psychology, uh, health services research. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. And we also want to give an especially warm welcome to our panelists for, for today. Uh, professors Miriam Steele and Guy Bosman. So we're really thrilled to have you here with us, uh, that you took the time to read our book in advance to be able to provide some thoughts and reflections on it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to help introduce the two of you uh, for everybody who are here. So Miriam is the Alfred J. and Monette C. Marrow Professor in Psychology at the New School for Social Research. She's actually also one of the pioneering researchers and theorists on, theorists on clinical applications of attachment theory and research. She's also, the, she's also the initiator of the construct of reflective functioning, and her research interests include intergenerational patterns of attachment, and her current projects explore, among other things, maltreatment prevention, body representations in attachment, and child and adolescent global mental health. Guy uh, is a full professor at KU Leuven at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences, and more specifically in the Clinical Psychology Research Group. His research concerns the mechanisms of attachment development and the role of attachment in the development and treatment of psychopathology. He's also, he's also founded an attachment-based family therapy training center in Leuven, and Guy has also made important contributions through novel and creative ways in bridging learning theory and attachment, and by linking attachment with trust. When it comes to learning theory, uh, I think that's fascinating because at least in Sweden, there's been difficulty seeing eye to eye historically between learning theorists and attachment uh, researchers. I really appreciate that one. Um, we'll soon begin, but I'll first provide some brief info about the meeting. Um, as you may have already seen, uh, Robbie has begun recording this event. Uh, so in case you don't want uh, to be recorded, um, then please turn off your cameras. Um, when we begin uh, soon enough, uh, me and Robbie and Pat will begin by giving you some background to why we wrote this book. Uh, we'll then have some reflections and thoughts from Guy and Miriam, and then uh, hopefully there will be time for everybody who are here to ask questions and sort of uh, provide reflections. Um, we'll close the event with a few final remarks, and I'll also try to remember to give you some information about a discount voucher in case you're interested in buying the book. Um, apart from recording, please re remember to mute your microphones. Um, and third, uh, also feel free to ask questions to us through the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat and uh, towards like the last third of this, where, when it's time for questions, I'll try to forward those questions to Pat and Robbie and also our panelists if they want to provide some reflections on, on the questions. Um, you can, uh, apart from the chat, you can also raise your hand. And if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, under reactions, you have the option of raising your hand. Okay, uh, I made that as quick as I could um, to not take up too much time. So for the first part, um, me, Robbie and Pat providing some background to the writing of the book. Um, we'll do this through me asking some questions to Robbie and Pad. Uh, and I'll begin by asking Robbie a couple of questions since he's the first author of the book. 
Uh, and Per, you may feel free to add to what Robbie says. Mm. Um, so for a first question, um, Robbie, why did you want to work on this particular book? Uh, thank you. So yeah, I guess from my perspective, there were four reasons. The first was that at the time, there's a scarcity of accessible, accurate and up-to-date books on attachment. Um, uh, second was that I was definitely seeing a lot of overstrong claims made by critics of attachment based in part on simplified ideas about what researchers were intending and what researchers had done. Um, a third, however, was that I was also seeing overstrong claims by advocates of attachment based on cherry picking studies or oversimplifications. So what I thought there might be some need for was something that um, was accessible, clear, um, not oversimplifying, um, but really above all focused on the main consensus findings of the last 50 years of research um, so that people kind of know really where to rest their weight uh, in, in understanding what attachment research has has found. Great. Um, and just to follow up on that, in, in what ways do you feel uh, that previous literature has been inaccessible or kind of uh, difficult to sort of grasp and, and, and use? Well, I guess um, a challenge has been that um, there's been a bunch of misconceptions about attachment that have been um in circulation a, a few that are particularly ones that have uh, i think are causing harm causing problems so one is that attachment is only about is only relevant to early childhood uh, a second is that attachment is basically about putting children into categories and boxes um, and that's that's really what's important when in fact actually to my mind uh, the species typical aspects of development are, are, are as critical if not more critical the, the more important idea is that children will have expectations about the availability and responsiveness of their caregivers in times of need and these expectations will vary based in part on the experiences they've had with those caregivers that that to me is the kind of more important bit um a third kind of misunderstanding or, or misconception I think is quite widespread is that uh, early attachment experience with parents determine a child's later outcomes in kind of like, and this is therefore fate and destiny, um, um, really without much understanding about um, the particular strength of associations. And in fact, actually, my observation is that very few introductory texts ever make any discussion, offer any discussion about the strength of associations. They say X is linked to, to Y, but how much is really important um it completely changes the nature of the claim and so therefore it's in a sense not surprising that you end up with both over and underestimations about the importance of attachment if no one's talking about uh, effect sizes um and then uh, another kind of uh, myth that i've been concerned by is the idea that practitioners should be kind of on the hunt on the lookout for disordered or disorganized attachments um uh, a, a, as a priority um not really with such a strong grasp of um what the available research is and, and some of the difficulties about extrapolating from group-based or population-based research to understanding what will happen in an indiv individual case with an individual child hmm. can i add a yeah. couple of things to what robbie said uh, yeah have... please do i don't want to reiterate any of the points i i, I would have said exactly more or less the same thing myself um, but but maybe just well clarify two things is that I think is important as uh, as attachment researchers we have occasionally I think in a way been complacent or contributed to putting too much weight or emphasis on on variation in attachment and this is I think entirely inadvertent no one has intended to do this but it's it's just a matter of pragmatism when you plan research. You need variation, right? If you if you can't do experiments, you need variation. And so if that's all we study, then over time we will kind of send the signal that variation is really, you know, the real deal of attachment theory. When we know, in fact, it's not. But readers don't know that. So that was one of the reasons why I really thought it was a good idea to 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 work on this book and of course we emphasize this also in the consensus statements and especially the court consensus statement so 
um, the background to, to this book is actually I was working on reviewing a book proposal called The Psychology of Religion for this very series. And then the editor asked me whether I could come up with some idea of a good book that this series should include. And I was thinking, damn, I can't do another book because I just finished um, another one. But then I was thinking of my friends, uh, Robbie and Tommy, and we had been working on a consensus statement. And so I felt we were in a pretty good position to kind of just, you know, develop that a little bit further. And, and Robbie had his cornerstones. And so it seemed like a fairly uncomplicated but important thing to do. Thanks kindly, Pat. And also, um, Robbie mentioned um, the species typical aspects. Uh, mm. I'm I'm not sure if everybody who are here tonight are familiar with kind of individual variations uh, in contrast to sort of species typical aspects. Can can you can you help us out here and elaborate a bit on that? Absolutely. So. So it's really the foundational ideas behind Bowlby's work is that offspring in most mammalian species and certainly in primate species, humans in particular, are strongly evolutionarily channeled more or less to develop attachment relationships, provided that there is some caregiver around that responds every once in a while to their signals. So almost 100% of offspring in our species develop attachments. Um, so that's a strongly species typical component of child development and critical for child development. Much more critical than variation in attachment patterns that are commonly observed in normal populations. Um, and I think it's... Um, um, so a, a lot of the emphasis on attachment should be about promoting the development of attachment if it's necessary and trying to help to prevent uh, major separations and losses uh, from attachment figures um, in addition to trying to optimize caregiver sensitivity to promote secure attachment in children. And occasionally in the applications of the theory, uh, people have lost sight of the idea uh, that species typical aspects are as important, if not even more important than the variation in attachment that is commonly observed in normal populations. Thanks, Pat. Um, before uh, handing the floor to Miriam and Guy, um, to the two of you, maybe if you can go first, Robbie. Um, we started talking about some misunderstandings and misconceptions about attachment. Uh, you, Robbie, were talking about some myths that we're addressing um, in the book. Um, why, do, why are these misunderstandings about attachment important? Yes, to my mind, attachment theory and research, as Per was saying, have tremendous value. Uh, so, for example, in understanding the, the, the potential harms of institutional care, it, it, the attachment theory and attachment research offers a really profound lens but the location of the value of attachment research and theory is misapprehended i think with when these myths are in circulation and so people go looking in the wrong places for the things that matter and things that are good about attachment research and it causes confusion it causes undue zealotry it causes um, criticism that doesn't hit the mark um what i'd love to see would be um a more true dialogue between different areas of research, research and practice, research and policy. And to do that, um, we need to be uh, finding our way towards these kind of key consensus findings of, of research, not cherry picking individual studies or um, basing claims on on the connotations of a particular word. Uh, we need to be talking to one, one another, looking each other in the eye, I think. Um, the other thing that I think is, is a problem about these misunderstandings is it makes it difficult for latest findings to, to to have the reception that, for example, there's amazing work going on at the moment about the effects of of, of the attachment network, the the multiple caregivers that are, could be around in a, in a child's life. Um, but it makes it very difficult for that research to land if everybody assumes that attachment research is just about mums and babies. Um, um, yeah. or, or, so I feel like uh, if we're going to learn from each other, if we're going to communicate, 
uh, then we need greater clarity. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just to add something to that, um, we may we may start reflecting on various countries and sort of different misunderstandings, but in Sweden, at least, I've recurrently been contacted by uh, moms who are distraught. They're, I can really feel they're crying and they're sad when they're emailing me. For example, they can't breastfeed their, their child and they're they're super worried about the child's attachment quality for example and what's going to happen to my to my child later on or being super fearful about um letting the child attend daycare for example and uh, these kind of misunderstandings um pad do you want to add something here um well i i could add with a couple of examples that parents are very often asking me and and other people about um, which also seem to be beside the point um, like um, do I need to sleep with a child every night um, do I need to breastfeed on demand um, what about the carrier can it be facing outwards or does it need to face me those kinds of questions are of course it's understandable that parents think that they may be somewhat important very early in the child's development. But the fact that they address those questions rather than the truly foundational questions about attachment is also a signal that uh, people's attention with regard to attachment related issues have kind of lost the um, lost bullseye in recent years, I think. So it's a little, I think it's time with a kind of sobering reminder to take to take attention back to the foundational issues, really. Yeah. Um, time flies. So I think we should um, leave the floor uh, to Miriam and Guy. Um, and we've been emailing a few times uh, in sort of preparation of this event. And we're super happy that you're going to offer some reflections and thoughts. Um, and one thing that we asked you to sort of think about is, what are your personal reflections and thoughts on the challenges of bridging empirical attachment research and its many audiences, policymakers, laypersons, uh, practitioners, and also the problem of misinfo in misinformation and, as we've been talking about, misunderstandings about attachment theory. So, uh, Miriam, if you want to go first, what are, what are your personal thoughts and reflections on, on this topic? First of all, I'll come off mute. Um, uh, firstly, I do want to congratulate uh, Robbie, Tommy, and Pear for yet again putting out um, into the field a book like this. Um, and when I was going through the book, I, I kept thinking I couldn't quite figure out the metaphor. And um, I have colleagues on this on this call who probably will be better at it than I am. But some kind of allusion to this book has something for everyone. And depending on where you're coming at it, um, you will take something very different. So for those uh, who are new to the field of attachment, as Robbie um, and Pear and yourself commented, there's the rudiments, the basics of um, what Bowlby and Ainsworth thought about, and then the research studies that emanated from that and then beyond to more current contexts. Um, I, the only the only example that came to mind, and perhaps it's because it's summertime and things are a little bit light here, is uh, I think in the first book of Harry Potter, he looks into this mirror and depending who you are, you see things very differently. You see what you want to see. It's a little bit not quite fitting this metaphor because it's what you desire. So I desired from this um, in some ways to be reminded or to think, what is it that you found so compelling? Um, and then on the other hand, and uh, maybe this is for after the call, there were a few things that were um, above and beyond and shocked me that I didn't know before. And I was like, wait a second, I'm, I'm not so sure. So first of all, congratulations around that. And then I think the unique piece around, um, and you, this is a direct quote from the book, that it stands in contrast to the idealized accounts of uncritical advocates. And I think perhaps I align myself a little bit too much in that group. Um, versus the denigrating accounts of unqualified critics, right? And so that it stands somewhere in between. So I think somewhere that's what we're grappling with. 
and that we need to, again, not throw the baby out with the bathwater, that there's so much that is rich and important mm -hmm. and that not to get too bogged down. And then on the other hand, to bring a critical eye. And I think that critical eye, including the words of attachment, you've really honed in on. You know, what did Bowlby have in mind? Uh, should he have changed them? Should we have used other words? Um, and, and what does that, where are we left with today because of that kind of history and unfolding? So there's two sides to that. I think whatever the word would have been, it still might've had these pitfalls. You know, whether it's Ainsworth words on sensitivity, they all could have been translated and distorted in that way. And that's what happens when you're popular. You know, it happened to Freud, it happens um, to a lot, that when you have a theory that goes out so far, of course, it's going to attract um, both the good kind of attention and the negative kind of features. But I think it has some of the fundamentals that makes it a very useful set of lenses, and not just one lens, but lenses through which to look at human experience. One thing it has to do with relationships, which we are all interested in. That That's, that's the basic it's from evolution, it's what makes life perhaps worth living. It also can get us into trouble along, along the way. So for me, the rudiments around, the Bowlby made sure to say, let's look at actual relationships, not just fantasies, not just, just simply what you think happened, but actual relationships. And with that, which is so important for the clinicians, is that it has to be based on actual observations, that, that it, it's, it's not enough to think or infer but what did you actually see? And find a way to note that, to find the words to do that. It does something to your brain to be asked to put into words your feelings or thoughts. Then it was around Bowlby's understanding around defensive processes that I think uh, you is very articulate and eloquent in this in this book around why that was so important and sometimes gets a little bit lost. And perhaps there's two kinds of attachment researchers those that are more on the Mary Ainsworth side and those are more on the John Bowlby side. We happen to be very familiar with the John Bowlby side just because he was a consultant um, to our work and, and we met with him um, personally. I think the interplay is so exciting in attachment work. That is the theory, the research and the clinical piece. One of the other places that we fail and perhaps it's only, I guess on this call, it's uh, Marinus and Marianne who've done such important work in terms of policy. Remember that it was Bowlby who changed the way hospitals engaged with parents and children to say, don't separate them. The child is distressed. And very quickly, who knows if it could happen today so quickly, but that we should, we know so much. So now it's not even just so much around gathering more information about the same kinds of things. Well, what are we going to do with all of this? And I think policy is um, an important place. I have more to say, but I'll turn it to Guy. <clears throat> oh, it, I was also looking for the unmute button. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I want to, yeah, th thanks for, uh, for the interesting reflections that you gave, Miriam. And, and I also want to thank uh, uh, the authors for, for inviting me to be here. Um, I think I like the way you introduced yourself, Miriam, as like one of the advocates. I think when I started, like getting interested in, in attachment theory, I think I was one of the more struggling ones. Um, like I, I was working in a child psychiatric unit and, uh, and we were like having, as a, as a clinical psychologist, and we were having like all these discussions about the cases uh, from an attachment lens and, and these discussions went like in all directions and like you could have like two very opposite opinions based on the same theory. <laughs> Um, between the colleagues, etc., and for me that was very confusing. And I know in those days, but that's now a long time ago. Um, I uh, like I, I looked at the literature and I couldn't really find the answers because, in in my sense, the theory was very metaphorical and broad, making it hard to really, uh, yeah, come to like very specific clinical handling or or advices. Uh, and I think the when when I was reading this book, I had that in the back of my mind, and I must say, like, I don't know if I ever would have started doing research <laughs> uh, if I had read it, because because like the 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 book really like 
puts the theory so much further in its development than, than 20, 30 years ago. So I think, I, I think just that is an accomplishment. And I, I concur with, with what Robbie said, like just the mere, like showing like, okay, on the one hand you have the history of the thoughts and, and how things developed and the, the ideas. And then you look at the, the actual effect sizes. I think that's a very important contribution of this book because it helps you to like put everything back into perspective and the phenomenon stays just as important <laughs> but from a clinical lens you get a better sense of like what it's actually about or how important it is or what are the, the things that matter etc so so for me the book gave me a lot of that and it of course left a lot of unanswered questions open which I personally think like if we really want to have like a very strong effect on policy making yeah I think answering these questions might be critical because because now like like in, in in Robbie and Peirce research you see like everybody like you have a metaphorical theory and everybody interprets it interprets it from their own view which I agree with Miriam it, it, it's okay it's part of a, a, a theory like being spread very broadly but on the other hand then then you get like people having an impact on policy makers because they are they have like a strong voice and then they cherry pick some elements from that theory and then then they make something really big about it and they they can really have like a detrimental effect on on how families are treated uh, just, just to say one thing, like the the the, the blame the parent, <laughs> uh, shall I say, like a, um, like underground <laughs> dynamic in how how caregiver uh, how professional caregivers typically look at families. They oh the kid is insecurely attached, so oh yeah there must have been things that went wrong in the in in the family etc and then you get like you you instigate a certain approach to families which i think is sometimes hurtful for all the family members instead of helpful and uh and and so if a if someone has like an impact on policy makers and cherry picks the part oh yeah there's a link between sensitive parenting and an attachment and then yeah, puts a lot of emphasis on uh yeah children need to be protected from <laughs> insensitive parents, then you get like what we see in Belgium is sometimes like an overprotective um, approach to families where children are maybe too easily separated uh, from, uh, from their parents because they see how oh, this child is insecure and the, this child's development goes in an insecure way, so we need to protect the child's um, attachment development and then they, they do tons of things that are eventually not helpful. So I think the the book really helps to like if you want to have an impact on policymakers at least to to bring back the nuance. Then the question is, will they read it? <laughs> that's uh, that's that's the next challenge, of course. But at least we can now use this. It's like a it's like a pamphlet. It's like a, it's like something you can show. Like okay, this is this is carried by the international community, not just my own opinion. <laughs> But, but, but then I also think like doing more of that research that like, yeah, even though the metaphors of Bowlby are beautiful and I, I, I learned to love them a lot, yeah, having started as a critic. <laughs> I think now I, I really admire much of what has been written and said. But then still, I think like if we can like transform the metaphor even more in like understanding specific mechanisms and, and, and components of the, the theory, I think that will also have like a, as I, I, that might be a next step to have like a strong impact on policymakers, but that's, that's what I feel. Or, these are my personal reflections. At least. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's exactly what we wanted you to offer. Thanks kindly for helping us along here and for your very kind and positive reflections. Um, uh, Guy, at first, uh, after the consensus statement, uh, for those who aren't part of it, were 70 attachment scholars from around the world. 
uh, it received some attention and a couple of foundations have been wanting us to help promote it to reach the to reach uh, policymakers. Um, and they're adamant that it should be summarized to maximum one page of bullet points for, for the policymakers to have time to read it. Uh, so I, I would like to say that our book is fairly brief, like a pamphlet to use your word, uh, word ski. I think it's about 100 pages in Word, excluding reference lists and so forth, which is in contrast to a lot of other books about attachment, uh, I would like to say. So hopefully it's, it's accessible that way. But Robbie and Pat, um, we've had some beautiful, super interesting uh, reflections and thoughts from Miriam and Guy. Anything you want to kind of follow up on um, and reflect on? Uh, Pat, you want to go first or shall I? Um, why don't you go first, Robbie, and I'll chip in later. So I guess something that I find sad about the common story that I hear, particularly, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in, in kind of child welfare, social work contexts is that the story that's told about attachment isn't very exciting and isn't very novel. Um, that there's an aspect where it tells you things you already knew and then you can nod along. Um, um, it emphasizes relationships, sure. Um, that children's experiences may shape their expectations, sure. But to my mind, some of the most exciting aspects of attachment research have happened in the last 10, 15 years. And this kind of... Um, uh, the penetration of attachment research from the last 10, 15 years into um, practice, into popular imaginary has been weak, I think. Even into allied disciplines doing applied research, what people think of when they think of attachment is very rarely where things have got to. An example that I gave earlier is the idea of the attachment network, uh, that uh, children have attachments to, to various caregivers who are familiar to them. And these relationships can, in various ways, together contribute to that child's development. It's not a common part of the story that's told about attachment but to my mind is one of the most exciting areas for for contemporary research um and it makes me really happy that miriam and, and Guy were willing to talk because again i find that that their research is one of these kind of areas that really excites me about the field so in particular miriam's work on interventions and Guy's work on uh, attachment not just as a, a long-term process but as something that can be uh, shifting moment to moment i think these are tremendous innovations really exciting and that most practitioners if you were to give them five minutes on either of these topics would be left with their minds blown um, but they it's difficult to get it into circulation so that's something that i was hoping that our book could do is talk a little bit about interventions talk a little bit about um um, um uh, state and trait and, and and these other things but also to put some cautions in place so for example something i think people do get very excited about is attachment and neurology neuroscience um the brain and actually one of the things that we highlight in in our book is that the evidence base is more limited much more limited than i think most people um who t uh, sort of talk about these things in the public sphere um uh, are aware so um yeah, to point to point to point in both directions. Yeah, and I can add by by, uh, by starting to thank um, Miriam and Guy for wonderful reflections. Thank you both. Um, could talk forever about it. I think uh, one of the themes that kind of popped up in my mind is this almost almost double standard that um, that one almost needs to have when it comes to attachment, or at least I certainly have it, is caution when it comes to application. Um, because you want to prevent misunderstandings and you want to steer the applications in the most evidence-based direction. But then on the other hand, freedom to explore ideas, even metaphorical ideas, when you do basic research. So I've been on record saying that uh, the attachment construct has very fuzzy boundaries and, you know, don't force us to decide whether something is an attachment or not. But then when we write these consensus papers or um, policy important papers, I'm on record saying a tablet is not an attachment figure, for example, because I don't want preschools to start to to go Wittgensteinian on uh, on attachment ideas. And I think that's kind of interesting for a theory to to both um, um, kind of drive creative, expanding kind of basic research and at the same time be so applied as to warrant caution in the applications. And I'm currently a little bit schizophrenic about where I stand on this, I have to say. Um, but I, I'll say one more thing about 
the background to the book, which I, which uh, made me, f you know, think that we should do this after all. It was not just a practical consideration of, of us being in the right place to do it, but also a very interesting challenge to get something down that is brief and accessible and at the same time is historically anchored and nuanced. So I thought that that's also a kind of um, double situation that interested me. And, and and Robbie wrote so much so well. I don't uh, understand how you did it, but we talked a bit about some of this stuff. And remember, Robbie, we talked about... Um, I was invited to give a lecture for mothers with intellectual disability about our research on attachment in their kids. Uh, first, I thought I would talk to a general scientific audience, but then I understood when time was getting closer that no, 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 I will actually talk. The vast majority of the people will be will have an intellectual disability. And I had a lot of anxiety about it because I'd never, um, um, you know, held a scientific lecture to them before. But then one morning I just awoke and had this very clear voice in my head, which is to talk and make things very clear, active voice, and you can actually convey a lot of content and add nuance by using very clear language. And somehow I think my personal experience of this is something that uh, Robbie was also able to put into print because he was writing, um, well, the lion's share of the drafts of the book, um, certainly. So that was, I'm quite impressed by that, Robbie. Thanks to the to the two of you. Um, a few sort of reflections from me here, Miriam. I'm, I was super happy that that you brought brought up Boldy's uh, sort of original work on, like that's mind blowing to me. Uh, being able to change clinical practice, not separating um, caregivers and 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 their infants, uh, kind of the. Um, changing that practice of believing that potentially that the caregiver's presence could be could sort of intrude and and when it comes to to in hospitals and the child's healing and so forth and like those traumas I I know several persons in Sweden who still remember uh, when they were young and they were uh, for for a few weeks separated from their caregivers when they were like as vulnerable as they can be being alone in a hospital kind of, and, and the impact they believe that had on their lives. So like those early landmark uh, achievements from attachment theory. I'm very happy that you brought that up. Uh, and Guy, uh, you were talking about Belgium and, and that sometimes that in practice that the social services may be overprotective and, uh, and occasionally uh, separating uh, children from their caregivers too quickly. Um, I believe we have the same situation in Sweden, that that attachment is often used as a buzzword, kind of uh, maybe not always referring to attachment in the sense that we try to sort of uh, describe the concept in the book, but in a in more of a, a broader way, kind of encompassing everything about relationships and, and so forth. And... Um, I'm teaching a lot to social workers and I know so many wonderful social workers, but also when with sort of the problems of resources and time and uh, training in, in, in assessment methods, it doesn't make life easy uh, for the practitioners at all. And, and also the demands on kind of evidence-based accounts for the recommendations. And um, so I'm happy that Guy, that you're bringing that up too. Um, and, to all of you, Miriam, Guy, Pat, and Robbie, what do you think kind of are important for the future uh, to keep sort of bridging um, the researcher practitioner gap uh, when it comes to applying attachment theory um, constructively, as constructively as possible? I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And while we hear those reflections, uh, I'd also like to open for everybody here to ask questions. You can either write them in the chat while listening to our reflections, uh, or uh, you can sort of raise your raise your hands uh, and I'll let you know when it's your turn to ask a question. So Robbie, Par, Miriam, Guy, kind of what should we do to keep bridging the research and practitioner gap? 
if I can um, just uh, speak up here, you know, we have now access to some very powerful interventions, including uh, VIPP and, and Marianne and, and Marinas uh, here to join us um, on this. And so I think there's there's got to be some way of making those more and more broadly available. Um, you know, especially those that are rather compact. There is nuance, there is training, but but how to get over to that, that it goes beyond a research so that, you know, I, we're thinking about an American context so that it is much more widely available. And then maybe as well, um, you know, if we flip some of this around, the, the separations are so critical and they can be such an important divider um, and breaking up relationships. The other side of this, if we look at it from the other side, you know, what can we do in very high risk context? Um, for example, I'm a little bit preoccupied with this, but I have a colleague who the other day, uh, there's a terrible situ situation in the United States where migrant families who've crossed the border seeking asylum are being put on buses and sent to New York City. And now there's more than 180,000 of them here. We, there's nowhere to put them. I, I understand that. But a colleague went to one of these shelter, it was a hotel really, and there was 2,000 families, not just people, but 2,000 families in 35 degrees Celsius heat outside uh, waiting to be processed. And if we use the power of what we know that the antidote to separation, that is something in the quality of sensitivity and parenting, we could actually offer in a much larger scale, some important, it's diffuse, it's not an intensive intervention, but something to alert people that actually you parents have an incredible role to play here and power in terms of helping your children through this crazy situation where they don't have food, they don't have shelter, it's hot, but they have each other and the child is looking to you for some sense of protection. So that's one of the places. And the other places that I'm pretty preoccupied with at the moment is that we know something about what works for whom across different interventions. We don't maybe put enough attention to who works for whom, that we take it for granted that any intervener is an excellent intervener. And instead of perhaps just doing the research on the quality of the intervention for that one mother or father and baby, maybe we enhance the training of that one intervener who might reach 500 mothers and children and get more bang for our buck that way. So I think a little bit of zooming out now um, might actually be very productive. Thank you, Miriam. I think I can add very briefly to what Miriam said. Um, strongly agree with all of that. And I'm thinking, um, what did you say? Buck for the bank, bank for the buck. Uh, it's, uh, I was thinking about maybe doing more of health economic calculations about uh, the societal benefits of um, uh, prevention work that... Uh, uh, that goes out widely uh, into to risk families in society and uh, and doing balanced calculations against the cost of actually placing children in in family homes, for example, and taking into consideration the risks of of serious uh, deviations in development that will also cost society in the long term. Which is not to say that it it should only be the monetary situation that steers our. Um, our work, but in this case, it happens to coincide with what I think is best for children generally. And and we do know that that uh, cost effectiveness is something that is quite important politically to uh, to affect our politicians. So I think that would be a way of um, of working to communicate the importance of the the interventions. And that's really what I sense too is the most important application is to continue to to try to steer. Uh, work for supportive um, um, interventions in families. Robbie, Guy, you're shaking your head, Robbie. Yeah, the, the just wanted to add something that we are trying is a uh, is to train entire um, service networks. So, so with like the basics and the what do we know and what don't we know, and uh, what it is and what it isn't attachment, etc., and what are like potentially 
effective interventions that you can use in different situations and yeah i'm 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 personally very curious but that would would give like we do like we trained like an entire province with like the independent of what kind of services they all got like the same kind of know-how trained by us and now we're interested to see whether that also helps to create a more like coherent professional caregiving environment for these families it's like but these are like play playgrounds <laughs> experiments that that you, you you never know like if it works then you have like something uh relevant to tell to policy makers so you know, yeah that's the other challenge i think to 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 create attachment mm. networks that are like more pro at a professional level that was something i wanted to add to what miriam was saying. yeah that's but i i, I like the idea of like the the, the that you better invest in, in a couple of very competent people that then can have like a, a bigger impact and so it's like two models that yeah it's interesting to see what what yeah. uh, what is most effective to do yeah yeah thanks for that it, uh, i it makes me think of, of some some colleagues who sort of sometimes to me point, have pointed out that societies can spend a fortune on in certain areas like space research or uh, and engineering but in comparison how much are we spending on social welfare training of practitioners providing resources i i kind of before time runs runs out i can come across as a as a critic of social services for example but i I am so thankful for everybody who 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 work as a social worker to really oftentimes provide so much support to struggling families. And I I kind of I appreciate efforts from attachment researchers um, nowadays kind of wanting to bridge this gap. I know there's talk about big uh, projects across the world kind of. A, how can we reach out more? How can, how can we ask the practitioners what they need? How, how can we provide more cost-effective training, um, be more accessible that way? And so I, I think there, there's multiple facets to address. Um, and finally, I'm very happy to see a hand being raised by Dee Hutchinson. Um, so uh, please uh, ask your question or provide some reflections. Thanks, Thanks so much. I'm Dustin Hutchinson, and I manage um, the National Children's Bureau's Government and Parliamentary Relations, and I'm a close um, colleague of Robbie's. And yeah, I was really fascinated by the research. It sounded really, really interesting. And I think it's so wonderful to get complex, systematic research kind of um, shared in an accessible, engaging way for a range of audiences. And I noted throughout the speech you talked about interest to um, policymakers, and I think there's definitely a huge amount of interest to poly policymakers in what you've discussed. I'll be interested in finding out more, and I'm sure they would be as well. So I'm happy to have a conversation, Robbie, if you'd like, about how we could arrange potentially for yourself to present to policymakers such as Department for Education and talk them through some of this research. And I think that they'd find that really valuable to inform um, policy decisions and based on research and evidence. So. I'm happy to follow that up with you, Robbie, if that's helpful. Wonderful, Dustin. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. Um, do, we have it, do we have any other um, questions from the audience or reflections? Time flies when having fun and it's uh, just Tom, seven Tommy, more I think we had one from Dominique in the chat. Uh, shall I read it out? Yes, please. Uh, uh, I can't, then I can't see uh, what's being asked in the chat. Ah, it's been sent directly to me. That's why. Okay. So, so Dominique uh, asks, how uh, does this book also consider how culture or ethnicity or identity or issues around diversity affect or impact attachments? Um, so for my part, uh, what I would say to this is that one of the main methodologies used by attachment researchers, the strange situation, um, is not especially well adapted to asking questions about um, the specific effects of particular cultural aspects of parenting. Um, it 
takes a lot of complexity and turns that complexity into, as we were discussing, categories of individual differences, which are absolutely responsive to issues around culture, um, um, ethnicity, diversity, but can be sometimes quite difficult to interpret in that regard. Um, we've got some of the world's leading experts on this topic on the call. So I, I, um, I'm hesitant to say too much, but what I will say is that the piece of research that personally I've found most profound on this topic is a meta-analysis from 2010, looking at the effects of ver various different forms of adversity uh, on children's attachment. Um, and um, Rina, so you're the senior author on that, the CRTL meta-analysis, were you the senior author? So anyway, um, the what the the headline finding that I found interesting was that any one adversity had a relatively slim relationship with child attachment. But at the point at which you start getting adversities rolling together, ramifying, impacting each other, having um, a kind of uh, ramifying, ramifying one another, having that kind of total cumulative effect, then you start to have very serious implications for child attachment such that uh, there was no statistical difference between five or more so different forms of risk or adversity and samples that have been selected specifically for being maltreated in terms of rates of disorganized attachment. I thought this was a profound finding because what that implies to me is that something like being an ethnic minority in a country in itself is shouldn't be regarded as uh, say like a risk factor. Uh, for insecurity in the strange situation. But at the point at which you roll in being an ethnic minority and in, and poverty uh, and other adversities and you keep rolling together, then actually they can ramify and, and um, cause difficulties for the family in terms of the um, the care that can be offered. Um, so if people want to look it up, I'll put the article into the chat. Um, uh, Chantal Sear is the, the first author. Um, um, other people might have thoughts on ethnicity and, and culture, though, um, particularly people who've been involved in research on this. Yeah, well, I would say that we we review some of the some of the findings on on culture in relation to the major assumptions of attachment theory and research. Um, um, we do so. If you're specifically interested in that kind of question, we do provide a review. Um, largely guided by by Marinas and and the Marians and others' work, but we also take into consideration a lot of criticism that has been raised by anthropologists, and we discuss that quite a bit in the in the book. And now I see that Robbie has also uh, pasted a link uh, to the paper that we just talked about. So. Uh, in a, if anyone is interested in looking that up, you can do so. Um, we're almost at the end now. It's 1957 here in Sweden. Um, so we're just we're, we're going to close this session in a couple of minutes. But uh, afterwards, um, I'll make sure to email all of you who have attended. Um, and, and you'll see, uh, I'll include this voucher from Routledge. So in case you're interested, uh, there's a 20% discount on the book valid throughout 2023. Um, and to close this event, I just want to say thanks kindly to all of you who uh, attended and, and shared this event with us. Um, and a special thank you, of course, to Guy and Miriam uh, for taking the time to read the book and, and providing your wonderful reflections. Very much appreciated. Um, Pad, uh, would you like to sort of make any closing remark? Uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending today and urge us all to continue to think wisely about the applications of the theory and work uh, so that it continues to to go in a supportive uh, direction uh, for for supportive supporting families uh, rather than disrupting families based on on attachment classifications I think that would be my that's kind of my most important concern at present and one reason for it is that we can see that people are struggling quite a bit and will probably struggle even more in the foreseeable future because of climate related changes and 
economical threats and and so on uh, so that it's important that we have our priorities straight when it comes to to applying attachment principles i think maybe Thanks that sounds, for that. that sounded a little dystopic perhaps or i didn't mean it that way um, no <laughs> at all <laughs> Um, I think I see your point. Um, thanks, Marianne, for the for the applause. Um, very kind of you. Um, so, well, there's nothing more to say for today then. Um, but thanks kindly for being here with us, and uh, let's keep working uh, together, all of us, for for the best of families, kids, caregivers. Um, um, I guess that's one of the key sort of uh, key benefits of attachment theory to help families. Um, thanks kindly for being here. With you, with you still here, I, I still have um, this need at some level to um, convey to you some of the shockers in there that uh, that that were that were uh, part of part of the book. You know, I think you know they must um, have like kind of popped um, out somewhere through all of um, the going overs, the robbers, yeah. such full um, such full engagement. Um, I'm very very much looking forward to this. So Actually, I'll, before I'll, before emailing you guys.